let me introduce you Ettore Mariotti. He's going to present uh, this doctoral meeting. Uh, the title of the doctoral meeting is Explaining Black Box AI Models. Yeah. Thank you. Of yeah, okay. What time is it? Great. So, um, hi, everybody. Uh, most of you know me already. And uh, so, I will consider this talk like a very informal thing, as if we were taking a coffee, but this time I finally have slides, so I can finally show you with pictures what I'm trying to do, what is my research, and so forth. Uh, while presenting, while preparing this presentation, I thought, uh, where should I stress my focus? Should I uh, present you what is explainability in general, or should I present you my work? I try to do both, and let's see how it goes. So, let me start with a question. Did you ever trust an algorithm? My suggestion is, my opinion is that actually you do. Because there are some examples where you actually trust the algorithm. When you go on Spotify and start a Spotify radio, there is actually a machine learning algorithm uh, down below, but we don't really know how it works. Well, we do know, but we don't really know how to interpret. And it actually choose the songs. When you go for a movie on Netflix, when you trust on the indication for Google Maps or going to a place to another, uh, trying to minimize the, the traffic and so forth. So, yes. We do trust some algorithms, even though we do not uh, directly know why it works. Why do we do so? Well, this is one of a, um, one possible idea is because it works. So there is this principle, trust what works. Not only this, um, there is another thing. In all this situation that I showed you, if there were a problem, if like if uh, the, the suggestion was not correct, it's not a big deal. So if 80% of the time of my, my, my next song on Spotify I like, but the 20% I don't like, it's not, such a, it's not a big deal. It's not uh, killing the business. The same thing with search result and um, content suggestion. So this is our whole class of models in which machine learning thrive as it is right now, even being a black box. But let me ask you another question. Would you ever trust an algorithm in other situation. So for example, imagine that you're going for asking for a loan to the bank and uh, the bank analyze your data and they say, I'm sorry, no loan. You would like to ask why. Or another situation, imagine that you, um, a, a, an automatic system, analyze your biometric data and find out that you have, uh, it claims to, that you have a very rare disease and that you should start a very expensive treatment with very a lot of complications. Would you trust the algorithm as it is, or would you like to make some inquiries some more? So in these other situations, these others, and also there is the legal case, for example, if you if you have some 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 legal issues. And um, what is different in this case? The difference is on the impact that this situation is having. So even though in this case we cannot, in a sense, uh, have a model that is correct 90% of the time, wrong 10% of the time, or well, we do, but it raises some ethical concerns. So in this sense, there is a new paradigm of our trust, which is trust what you understand, which is also, by the way, a good business principle uh, if you ever want to um, invest your money and so forth. Uh, no, no investment advice. Um, <clears throat> so the natural question is, how can we understand AI? A very good question. And this is what I'm trying to understand in a sense. Uh, there is this very old story um, about uh, an elephant that joins a city of blind people. OK, so there is this, this, is this elephant and all these blind people start to interact with this beast and try to understand what it is because this, these people never saw, well, they never see anything, but they never had an experience of an elephant eh, in a sense. So they start touching and they start describing and one person say, you know, and they think, oh, this is a snake. This is something like a snake. And the other person say, no, no, this is something like a wall. It's soft and so forth. 
no, this this is actually very tough. It's a different thing. So what's what's the meaning of the story? Uh, this is our black box. This is our AI. We are blind. What we can do is we can try different approaches, different tools in different positions. They are all wrong, but they are all right. Each of the tool will be giving us a different perspective on the understanding of this machine. So let's try to define the concept a little bit better. What does it mean explaining the black box? It might seem a, a simple thing, but if we dive deeper, there is some richness to it. So first of all, what is a black box? Black box is a useful engineering concept in a sense where you there is a system where you give an input and it returns some outputs. Um, for examples, I know some of you are from electronics, uh, a microchip, you can consider it a, a black box when you just know, when you just care about, OK, if I just give this input, I know that the output is going to be amplified. I don't need to know how it is the layout of the transistor inside. I can just abstract it away and just consider the input output relationship. Consider as a parallel the AI system as a microchip whose design was learned from data and you don't actually know the design. The only thing that you can do is try to perturb the input and observe the output. So you would like to understand how it behaves with different techniques. And the very big important question is what is an explanation? Uh, which we might have some intuition about that, but when we go scientifically deep inside this question, uh, it's less trivial to understand what it is. Um, we can think about an explanation between two humans as, as I, I think it's like a, a, a transfer of knowledge, a transfer of, of a factor. I'm explaining you something. So what does this mean? It implies uh, humans, okay, first of all, very important implies that we share a common language, that we share some structure of knowledge that is might be different, but is similar. And, uh, and the important thing as humans, at least we have, we all have the same senses. So we have some ground experience on which we can have this transfer of knowledge. Uh, this becomes more problematic when we try to ask a system that does not, in a sense, think like us to explain its behavior to us. What does it mean then to ask for an explanation to a neural network? What does it mean to ask for an explanation to a decision tree? And so on and so forth. Uh, this is not a completely answered question. There are different takes on this, and this is what I'm trying to, to, to show to you today. And there are many ways in which explainability is uh, um, analyzed in the literature. This is um, um, a chart that I kind of like, a taxonomy that I kind of like. So we say that we have an explainable system, we have explainability that is made of two different things. One is that if it is, oh, be careful, if, if it is interpretable, it means that if it what it actually says to me is human understandable. Like, uh, for example, when you write some code, it, it gives you a, a debug error that is completely under, not understandable, that is not really interpretable. Uh, but the most important thing to me, as the first thing that we should uh, enforce, is uh, fidelity. So is the explanation that I'm giving to you actually describing the model beneath? Or am I just trying to persuade you? Because if I give you an explanation that is very sound, that you kind of understand, but is completely unrelated to the model that I'm describing, then we have a problem. Then I could be more persuasive and deceiving rather than explaining myself. So I, I, as I'll show you later in this presentation, I've worked a lot in this fidelity faithfulness domain. <clears throat> so. Uh, another uh, another another category that I would like to, to add or at least present to you is the plausibility section. So uh, a good explanation in theory is not only faithful to the model, so it actually describes the model and interpretable, so we can kind of understand, but it's also a desirable property that is plausible. So does it make sense? Does it resonate with our inner working? Uh, 
Um, usually, this category is is very uh, is a human thing uh, in a sense, uh, but it can be very very helpful. For example, if you have a um, if you want to measure, uh, we will we will come to how we measure these systems. But basically, uh, if you have the human uh, at the end, uh, you would like to, for example, help the human. And some people claim that actually being helpful to a human is really about providing a plausible explanation. So something that it actually makes sense that gets you going uh, while also being faithful and, and interpretable, of course. So um, how is XA, what, what can we do with XAI? How does XAI work? So uh, there are two approaches, mainly two big approaches. The first one is, uh, OK, we have a black box. Forget about the black box. Try to use what is called a white box, which is a model that is much more interpretable. We can see inside how it works and from how it inside works, we can extract some knowledge, some stories, some facts that can be useful. Uh, the other approach is called a post hoc approach because we say, OK, we don't know how the model works. So we a black box could be a random forest uh, and so forth. Let's just the only thing that we can do is observe the output. It's called post hoc because from Latin means after the fact. We're trying to give some explanation after the after the prediction, after the output has already been given. Um, when should we use XAI? This is an important question because XAI is not necessarily mandatory for everything. Um, this is a this is a nice flow chart if you if you wish. Like is important explainability relative to predictive performance? If it is not important, like for example, uh, our Spotify radio, then uh, no problem, like don't care about XAI, just go use any model that suits you. There is no, there is no, there is no problem. If it is very important, on the other hand, then the suggestion will be then use an explainable, interpretable model. For example, I don't know the legislation in Spain, but I know for in Italy, um, the credit scoring system for uh, allowing you to get a loan from the bank, uh, they use a lot of your data but they have very strict regulation on the kind of models that you that you can have. And I even talked to some of these researchers. They use a very simple linear regression and uh, where they can see all the coefficient and with that ensure some safety and ethical concern. So this thing is actually used in the world right now. Uh, another question is, does a complex model perform better than interpretable model? Because there is also this tension sometimes uh, going interpretable is against going the maximum performance that you could in principle reach. And if a complex model, sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not true. When you still have an interpretable model that is better than a black box model, then just use the interpretable model. You have the pros of the, that you can explain it if you need it to do. Uh, but uh, if you can't, uh, if you can't, then do you use an uh, use a black box? Like if you don't care about the interpretability that much, uh, or let's say, sorry, the complex model be performed better, then okay, you can use the, the black box, but then you can provide some kind of explanation that are post hoc. So um, in my research, I I try both approach because it's important to have a, a, a gist that it depends. Different tools are more important in different situations. So uh one thing that we could say is let's go full interpretable and see where it can lead us so again what does it mean to go interpretable it means that we have a white box where we can look inside the box and and see some kind of the, the behavior and we can be start to build some stories about what happened inside the box so for example we could build a factual explanation or a counterfactual explanation as Ilya is a, is a big expert of this group for example or we could try to understand how the model behave in general. Uh, we can extract all these stories and then present it to the user according to the user needs. Um, what are white boxes? Uh, there are different groups of white boxes. Uh, it's not an infinite amount of models. You have uh, linear models, as I said, decision trees, where you 
you start from a root node and you ask, uh, is this feature bigger than this? And then you descend the tree in this way. So it really mimics how we think in a sense. Uh, the Shizu rule system is instead a, a, a list of rules that activates is that if this happens, then do this. If this other happens, then do this. And then there is this other uh, class of model, which is called generalized additive models, which is uh, in a sense a uh, more powerful version of linear models, but it's still interpretable. And the GAMS, it's uh, what I what I what I like. I didn't know about this kind of model until I started my PhD. Uh, basically, the idea is uh, you have different features. You have P features in your tabular data set. And you consider a function that predicts the data that is of this form. Let's just make a, a even nonlinear transformation, but only of this feature, plus a nonlinear transformation of only this second feature and so forth. This kind of structure allows you to uh, then, once you have fitted the model, inspect this function. Uh, individually. Since they additively compose, you can study one at a time and then get a sense of what is going on. I have a small example of, uh, of, uh, of how a GAM works on a real data set. Um, there is this very simple data set um, assessing the ability of uh, young children, 15 years old, uh, to, to, to apply reading mathematics and science knowledge to meet real life challenges. Uh, I don't want to go too much into the details about the data set, this data set because, to be honest, uh, I have I don't have much experience. It's just for illustrating the point of how this tool can can be useful. So you have different indexes that can uh, that describes you um, the population, and the objective is uh, um, per country predict this science score that has been made through some kind of questionnaire. And so when you fit a gun, what you have is that. You have these uh, different six curves, and each curve um, depends on the x-axis is, for example, the education index. And you can see that uh, on the education index, the score tend to increase in this way. So uh, you can, by inspecting each of the, it's called the shape function, it's technical term, uh, you, can, you can have a sense of what is going on. Uh, interesting, if you, if the, too, if you are too rich, then you're probably going to use science a little bit less. You can find uh, this 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 cool uh, artifacts. Uh, on this uh, GAM path, um, what I proposed is to um, do it fit it in another way. It is usually fitted with uh, small decision trees, uh, but I said, uh, okay, wait a moment. I can uh, implement this structure in PyTorch. For those of you that know what it is, it's a deep learning library. So uh, if I implement it in PyTorch and in such a way that, for example, each function is composed of this, what I call steps, it's just a, it's just a sigmoid, then you can build uh, any function, no, like this. Uh, but the important thing is that once you have a structure that can learn anything, then you can impose some regularization terms. So for example, you could say, you look, I want a sparsity in the number of, uh, um, of functions, so a few shapes function. I want uh, the shapes to be smooth. So, for example, I, 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 I enforce that all of these should be of some sense. And um, I tested it out, huh? oh, of course, on many data sets against uh, many other models. Uh, I don't want to go too much into the details, but the results were, were good in the sense that uh, it is not winning always, but it's it's a winning solution of the Pareto front, which is a fancy way of saying it achieves a good trade off between being uh, well performing and being uh, well interpretable, being being less complex. And, and this is a small bonus thing. It's not necessarily a scientific uh, result, but uh, it's too beautiful not to show to you. Uh, when we have interpretable models, we have interpretable training. So have you ever seen a neural network uh, during training, how it changed inside? So this is a toy example that I did. These are some, this is the target function to be learned. A little bit noisy, the, the orange dots. And the, the purple lines are the, the steps, as I call the steps, no? This is the, the, these are the parameters in a sense of the network. And the real function is this blue one which is this, the sum of all these steps. Here, what I will show is a, is a loss uh, and how it changes. And this is what happens when we train the system.
fell like that. Bam, it opens up here and it starts to, to fit to understand also this part. And I, I always thought it was a very nice, uh, very nice video. And uh, sometimes here you have this, whoop, you can, uh, uh, what, what does happen here? This is the optimizer that try to see if you are in a minimum, in a local minimum. So it tries to push the, 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 the function. It makes it weaker a little bit to find a better option. And this is the final result you see. So uh, actually the neural network, the output is this, the blue line, but is the sum of these purple lines. So this was the interpretable thing. Um, before going black box, full black box, there is an alternative thing that we can do, which is, what time is it? Oh, it's good. Um, can we do a surrogation? What does it mean? We have a black box that works uh, remarkably well. Uh, instead of explaining with a post hoc thing, we could say, OK, we have an interpretable system that works pretty well. Let's train the interpretable system, the white box, to behave exactly like the black box. So you can, for example, have a lot of inputs, even that outside of your data set that are not labeled, and you label them with the black box. And then you train the white box on this uh, augmented data set. In this sense, then you can interpret the white box while keeping the, 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 the black box as the predictor. Because uh, in theory, they should more or less ans give the same answer, but this is interpretable and this is not. And these are some, uh, some experiments that I did. Uh, this is the number of nodes of a, of a decision tree. And as it grows, when it tries to, to mimic, uh, this is the black box. Uh, in this case, it's a, it's a random forest. Um, another way, as I said in the beginning, is going post hoc for explaining the black box. So let's go directly at the end and perturb the input to see how the output changes. And the, the most important class of explanation in this pool is called the feature attribution techniques. Uh, which is basically um, a tool that is answering the question, what was the impact that the feature had on the final prediction? So we have some input. What is the most important part of the input that led me to this output? And you might think, why, 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 why should I care? How can this be useful at all? And there is a neat example. It's famous. Maybe some of you already know it. Uh, there was this um, challenging task to distinguish for a uh, computer vision uh, image detector Husky versus Wolves. And in principle, it should be difficult because they share many features. Uh, the, the Husky is a kind of wolf, uh, the wolf is a kind of Husky. They even made a movie about that. Uh, but the neural network was extremely good, like 100% precision, no confusion. So you might wonder how how can it be like how I, I wonder uh, like congratulations neural network I, I never knew that you could be so good. Um, but for example, take a look at this. This should be a husky, but was predicted as a wolf. So uh, why was that? They applied one of these feature attribution technique, and they exposed uh, what they called uh, artificial stupidity. So. Uh, this is the explanation. So this was predicted as a husky because of this. And what is this? This is the snow. So uh, huskies in all the data set were dogs of people and they were pictured into domestic uh, environments or um, maybe in a park, but without the snow. While the wolves, they are animals that live in the snow, they are wild. So all the picture in the training data set were from um, wolves in the snow. So actually, the model didn't learn to, to distinguish husky versus wolf, but it learned to distinguish between snow and non-snow, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, so it's not really stupid. It's actually pretty clever, you know, because you're solving a, a, a problem by by looking at the things that I would have never expected. But these kind of issues, if you're not uh, if you not pay uh, attention, can arise also in other domains, like for example the the the, 
the, the health issue or the, 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 the credit scoring. We might be thinking that we are answering something, but there is actually a bias. Let's call it a bias, or I would say a property of the training data set that we had a different population that leads to this weird behavior. At least with this tool, we can try to uh, uncover biases of the model. Um, this is the same idea. Uh, but applied on tabular data set instead of any images. So uh, if you have a data set that this is predicting. Uh, I don't I, I'm sorry, I don't remember what is predicting, but if, if you have a feature, I think it's if you if you make more than 5000. Oh, yes, this is the adult data set. If you if you make more than 5000 data set, uh, 5000. 50,000 dollars per year. In the 50s in America, um, you can you can build your models upon that, and then you can apply this feature attribution. So for each single person, you can have an explanation on why the model thinks that um, you uh, you you will be earning more than than not. So it's answering this way is answering the question: What is the impact that the feature had of moving the model away from its baseline? It's a technical detail, but you can think it always like what is the impact of the input feature? And here I have a slide of what are Shapley values, um, which is the mathematical tool that allows us to do this kind of uh, um, feature impact assessment. Uh, um, Shapley values is, a, is an idea that comes from game, game theory. So um, it is mathematically uh, sophisticated a little bit, but the idea is if we are playing on a team, OK, if we are playing again in some kind of game, um, my effect, my payoff to the final, to the team, uh, um, should be a weighted contribution of my marginal contribution. So the marginal contribution is how many goal would my, uh, would my team score with me, without me? This compared uh, with how many goals uh, will, the, will the team have scored with me inside. So this is my marginal contribution to the coalition. If you average across all the coalition, you can get these nice uh, numbers. Um, so we can, uh, I did use this tool, the Shapley values, as an heuristic for complexities of models. So if we agree that this is a this is an explanation that is worth having, um, we can uh, we can see that some explanations are sparse in the sense that only a few elements characterize the whole explanation. All the other elements are to zero, while others are more dense. So uh, the idea is explanation B is easier in a sense to digest than explanation A, only in virtue of the fact that I have to read at me as a human, I have to read less, less explanation. I have to make my mind about what happened with less, with less things. It's a, the, uh, a principle of parsimony in the literature. And you can make this a little bit more formal. Um, you can call it well, the explanation mass, uh, which is the absolute length of this. And you can gradually um, say, OK, what is the, what are the number of features that I have to read in order that I capture 80% of explanation mass, 90% of explanation mass, 95% and so forth. If you fix a threshold, then you can compute this number for, for all the elements in your data set and you can have a number that kind of tells you how complex is a model. And this property is nice because it uh, correlates, so the property is only why it correlates with other existing metrics that we know are proxies for interpretability, like in a decision tree, as I told you before, you can count the number of nodes, which is equivalent also to a number of rules in a decision system, or a number of leaves, which is the, the rule list length in a sense, and they correlate nicely. And why is this is important? Because this allows us to compare models that are uh, ontologically different, to use a fancy word, that means that they, they they start from very different uh, assumptions, like how can you decide if a decision tree is more interpretable than a linear model? Uh, it depends on the tree, it depends on the on the on, on the linear regression, it depends on the coefficients. What metric do you choose? Because 
you don't have coefficients in the decision tree and you don't have uh, uh, decision points uh, in the linear regression. But if you have this metric, you can, uh, it's, it's model agnostic, so you can compare the behavior of different methods. Uh, I'm close to the, to the end, so hang on a little bit. Uh, the, I'm, I'm, I'm going a little bit fast on this because um, this is uh, future work, something that I started to do. Can we use feature attribution for text model, model that works on text, and for example, natural language generation? And this is a kind of a hot topic because uh, some of you may have heard of these new very big language models that are very good now at producing text, and uh, they are so good that is similar to how a human thinks. So maybe by studying this large language model, we can get some insight on how human thinks. Uh, so the, the 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 floor is ripe of things to study, and this is my my small attempt at to trying to do something. So. Um, the same idea. Uh, how does this big language model work? Uh, you start from a prompt, famous initial prompt, and then what you do is kind of a very fancy autocomplete. You just predict the next token, the next token, the next token, the next token, the next token. And one approach for explaining this with the feature attribution techniques like the ASCII versus Wolf is um, okay, what was the probability? Because this was sampled with some probability. Let's give me the probability of this sample and explain this probability in terms of the token that you have already seen, which was basically your input. And and yeah, and you and you have this kind of uh, explain, ever growing explanation because every for every new token you have new new features. Uh, if you have ideas on how to aggregate this, uh, please talk with me because uh, for now this is just a very nice picture. Uh, but uh, but uh, I I feel that some some good things could could, could be extracted from this. Uh, anyway, in my in, in the work that I uh, recently done, uh, I didn't try to analyze uh, what can we understand from the feature attribution, but how can we assess the faithfulness of a feature attribution? Because we don't really know how the model works uh, in the first place. So. It was the case that when I implemented these methods, I said, okay, how do I know if I implemented this correctly or if there is a bug or, you know, or if what I propose is sounded in, in any way. And um, I, I applied an idea uh, that comes from uh, Anaria Stuart, um, a colleague of mine, I could say right now. Uh, so the idea is let's build a, I should have explained this better, but anyway, uh, we don't know where the explanation would lie because we don't know how the model behaves. But what we can do is to make a trick. So we build a, what is called, um, let's call it a textual mosaic because it comes from an image mosaic where you put different images. So let's suppose that I have a, um, a model that tells me whether a sentence is of I have a positive sentiment or a negative sentiment. So I love this movie is a positive sentiment. I hate this actor is a negative sentiment. So I can put uh, I love this movie and I have uh, I hate this actor in the same sentence, to, in the same input to the model. And then I ask the explanation method. OK, explain to me why this composition that I know is better and better than good. Uh, why this composition is good. And what I can measure then is how much is the attribution lying on what I know by construction is good. Uh, if I measure the, 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 there are different measures that we can take on this, but this is the main idea. We kind of construct by construction, we build a semi ground truth. There are some assumptions involved, it's not completely perfect, but that allows us for at least for comparing different methods. Because I didn't tell you, but there are like, seven or eight different methods that are very different from each other and in their paper they all claim to be the best and there is no way of assessing it as is typical in unsupervised task uh, by the way so for being more concrete um here you can see also the difference into two 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 models uh this is what i called the mosaic before so this is the sentence i of running i hate to write introduction the delightful cup of tea and what a horrible movie and, and we are trying to explain uh, what is the positive class, what are the tokens or the set of tokens that contribute to, a to, to, to something with respect to other things. 
And, um, and yeah, so basically the idea is let's consider what is the fraction of positive attribution that falls into the correct, so the correct um, uh, part of the input against everything else. So we, 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 are, we, we did some of that uh, on a bigger data set uh, with two models and so forth. Uh, first of all, it's nice that uh, if you have a random model, you have a kind of random like behavior, it's like a Gaussian centering in 0 0.5. So this is the random and this is instead a, a, a model that we think it worked correctly. They have very different behavior according to the score that we formulated. This is a good sanity check. And these are all different methods that we tested with also different uh, hyperparameters configurations. And this is the basically the, the box plot, the box and plot distribution. So here is saying the quantiles on the full data set of the scores. And uh, so if you try to explain a natural language model, my opinion, use integrated gradients with the unknown uh, token as a baseline. Well, that said, uh, we're, we're almost finished. I'll ask you again, would you ever trust an algorithm now? And I suggest an answer. My answer to this would be trust an algorithm when you have the famous health issue and so forth is only if it can explain itself better than I just did in this presentation. Don't settle for a random output. Thank you. Now, questions? For a question. Uh, uh, have you uh, considered using some kind of these techniques to detect, uh, for, for example, for language models, uh, uh, hallucinations when you, uh, you obtain uh, responses that are not uh, included and mean in the input? So, uh, so what I what I've worked on now is to assess what is the good method that allows me to have a good attribution, so the faithfulness. And now there is this big open door to what what can I use it for? And I think hallucination is, for example, a very good uh, a very good thing because you can say, okay, you you are definitely inventing something here. Uh, what did, did you did this come from the from the previous token? Where did it come from? And, and and for sure this can be helpful at least for understanding and who knows maybe even for better guiding than the generation so the answer is not yet but i would like to yeah because these big language models it's very complicated to, to understand yeah 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 it's uh, arguably yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah 130 gigabyte of uh, uh, random random to us multiplication no uh, this is another thing. It's not that the black box is well. The concept of black box uh, is is quite detailed in the sense uh, we do know in principle how it works. It's just uh, a lot of metrics multiplication, cross attention. If you want, I can tell you all the num all the parameters, what are the precise value, and uh, but it's not really telling something that is meaningful to us. So the big challenge is: can we have a description that is meaningful to us. Uh, one way is to direct the attention to what is in common, that we have in common, which is the input space in this case. Yes, Lorenzo. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, OK, I don't have it here, unfortunately, but I also measured uh, um, the performance, the trade off between. Let's see, maybe I do have it here. Sorry. This is a good question. Sorry. Eh? So. Ah, don't spy on my paper. So, yes. Uh, this is a this is the trade off of speed uh, and accuracy. I, I measured also the speed and, and you can see. So let me explain the plot. This is the mean score. So the higher, the better. And this is the time 
in logarithmic axis. So the higher, the very much worse. Um, some of them that works, by the way, not even nicely, are ex basically exponential in the input space. This is much larger because the input sentence were, were longer. But this, uh, the integrated gradients, my personal favorite, which is the one that has the highest mean and the lowest variance, by the way, it still runs at, uh, at around a half, uh, half a second here, something like that. And, uh, and with bigger sentences of the order of one second per, um, per explanation, per instance. So depending on how much, how many things you would like to explain, there is some, it's still computationally tractable. There are some solutions that are even faster. For example, this, which is gradient sharp, uh, though it's less faithful uh, to the model. It has some issue about convergence. It has uh, other kind of issues. But um, but yes, I still think they, they are usable. You can, you can, you can read apply it. Uh, and, and another interesting thing, since I know you work in computer vision, um, this work tried to mimic another work that was done uh, with the same idea, uh, but earlier and in the computer vision. So instead of having two sentences, they had two pictures or four pictures. And interestingly they ha enough, they had different results. Uh, for them, uh, integrated uh, gradients weren't the, the, that well performing. Uh, but it's also uh, important to be said that uh, these methods have many hyperparameters. And uh, up to now, there was really no, no way of choosing them just based on intuition and uh, if they look nice. no. But the problem is that if you base your judgment on what look nice, then you're very prone to subjective psychological biases of, OK, this looks nice. Let's keep it this way. So I, I think that we should redo the experiment into trying uh, different, uh, different parameter configurations. Uh, uh, yes. Thank you, Tom. That's very good. It's not fast. So, you said hi, Katrin, uh, our garden in the uh, general life density model. Mm -hmm. As you introduced them to us, uh, you showed us a plot where you uh, reported some uh, experimental results where uh, you effectively assumed the millage of future statistics, right? Furthermore, the features that you showed us in the plot, they were all numerical. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, how did you actually explain uh, black boxes if the if millage of the feature space is not available to you? Using so uh, let me try to rephrase the question. Uh, how can we use interpretable models if the input space is not understandable? I thought that's a very good uh, answer, a question, and the answer is we cannot. Basically, if you want to have an explainable system, you must start from an, in, an interpretable uh, an interpretable input. Because if not, I, I will tell you, like if you apply a, a linear model on the embedding of a neural network, for example, or, or a GAM or a decision tree, you can have an explanation and tell you, oh, look, the dimension number three correlates with the number number six. And when they sum up, they predict this. But you don't have really a meaning of what does this dimension number three, which is neural number three, uh, represent you should propagate it back to the input space in order to have something that uh, we and the machine uh, kind of know what we're talking about, if that makes sense. So yes, uh, for interpretable system, you'll need to start from interpretable inputs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, well, I don't know. 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 I don't Just a question. Um, just a question. So, just the equipment that we are using, basically, the equipment we are using, and 
My question is the biggest knowledge of um, is there any correlation between application modeling or do you have five different sets of yes. Is there any correlation in application to this application domain and the common sustainable image? And also would there is a trade off in so um I would stress that these are metal on a just a linguistic level, so we know what we're talking about. These are methods explanation methods that explain a model okay and basically we we try to apply the same uh, uh, evaluation procedure to the different methods into two different data sets for answering your question about the, the different data sets uh, they are the same task in the sense that they're both trying to predict what is the sentiment because this was an easy way to set up the experiment but uh, for what I can tell, there is a, a remarkable similarity into at least the ranking of the algorithm of the method, sorry, uh, of the explanation method uh, uh, with regards to, um, again, the, the faithfulness to, 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 the, to the underlying model. Uh, These preliminary results, it feels like um, yeah, they, they, it's, it's remarkable to me that you know, you see this tree and see this tree. OK, uh, OK, maybe lime here. Uh, it, it was much faster than, than than here in this case, uh, relatively. But it's remarkable how they keep their, their, their order in a very in a very similar way. And of course, we don't until we try on other data sets, we don't know um, if this relationship is going to preserve if it is task dependent i su i i suspect that these results could be taken generously with some good general generalizability so i would think that this kind of relationship maybe slightly different would hold also if you try this on different data sets and yes about the the the, the, the timing and trade-off um well, in this case, for us, gradient shuffle was faster, even though a little bit less performing. And uh, but also, let's take in mind that this new metric can help us also into developing new feature attribution techniques. There may be uh, some improvements to the uh, to the existing application techniques that improve the convergence speed, so the time, uh, while hopefully maybe even increasing a little bit this 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 score. Yeah. Uh, can I answer this first before you you ask the second? Because if not, I forget. Uh, so we are not. So the task here is 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 very special in the sense that we are not using a language model uh, or a model that acts on language for, for example, uh, generating language. Blue score is a similarity match between the output of text. OK, what we are measuring here is uh, the explanation of the method. What is that is this this vector of numbers? on the tokens that say, oh, look, this token was super relevant in this case for predicting this thing in, in this way. Uh, maybe I have a picture here that explain it a little bit. Um, so yeah, uh, your, by the way, your your confusion is perfectly acceptable because uh, I didn't explain that much this, this, this score. But you can see this is another example of what I call a mosaic, you know, these are taken from this data set of movie reviews, uh, lacks of traumatic punch and death. And, and, and when you ex explain the, the negative class in this case, so on the right side is the negative class, 
you can see that this method is attributing a lot to this. Uh, one of the most repellent things, uh, so mixed results, the most could be also positive, but then repellent to make it negative and so forth. An offbeat thriller and, and stopping the inhaler. So we are actually focusing not on the output of the model in a sense, but on the explanation on the output projected back to the input space. And the metric is, is computing like uh, what is the fraction of positive uh, attribution that lies on the correct class? And you can get this number in this case, it's 91%. Does this explain the result of the question? The second question? I think you can definitely apply that, though with some care. Uh, I've never worked, unfortunately, up to now with time series. But uh, for sure, you always have some input uh, and then a model that processes it and some output. And uh, depending on the kind of model, you can use different methods. Uh, the most relevant thing that we'll say to you is uh, be careful of what is the baseline, because many of these methods requires to explain to you something with respect to another thing, with respect to um, an input that should be without a signal. OK, so and it depends like for images is the black image or text. We found out that the best baseline was the uh, special unknown uh, token is a special token that is used by this Tibet for tokens that it doesn't know what is it about. So for time series, you will have to find what is the, the most appropriate representation of a meaningless time series or of a time series to which you, you could ask the question of how do you explain this out with respect to this input? But definitely yes, and I think there are some uh, um, works in, into the, the, the tabular data uh, time series uh, application domain. Thank 
Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Victoria, and thank everybody who is here.